today I am looking forward to ending the series that is a 10-part series, not because I want to get out of it, but just the idea that this has been the longest series I've ever done in my life. Let's face it, the longest you've ever been put through in your life. And, uh, and today we are concluding it. It was a 10-part, but it went through all uh, 12 disciples, at least it will have by the time we're done with this uh, service. And so I want to uh, give a shout out for a book called 12 Ordinary Men. It's by John MacArthur, and, and that has been such an inspiration, the strongest inspiration as I've been studying through this series to be able to bring the messages that I have brought to you. It's an incredible book. And today we're getting to the very last disciple. You probably know who I'm going to be talking about. In looking at the lives of history's most notorious traitors, we can see in history uh, Cassius and Brutus, and they stabbed Caesar. We see Marta, Mata Hari, and she was a double agent for France and Germany, and so she's known as a great traitor in history. Coming more uh, local now and bringing it closer to the date in which we're living, Robert Hansen, 25 year FBI agent, was a double agent, and he was an agent also for the Soviet, former Soviet Union. And during that time, he received from the, the um, uh, USSR $1.4 million and diamonds, and he ended up getting life in prison in 2002, and he was responsible for the deaths of quite a number of FBI uh, agents. Today, I'm going to talk about the most notorious traitor of all time. His name is Judas. But remember, it's not the Judas that keeps saying in Scripture, Judas, not Iscariot, who is trying to separate himself from this one. The one I'm talking about today is Judas Iscariot. And there was another Judas that was a disciple, but this is Judas Iscariot. He is the one who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And I'm going to talk about that with you today. Again, take notes if you desire. Uh, there will be a few things here that I think you're going to learn about this individual. If you think you know everything about Judas Iscariot, you don't. So get ready for this, but take notes if you want to. Judas Judas's name appears last in every list of the disciples except for when we see the disciples are listed in the book of Acts. In the books, book of Acts, the list of disciples doesn't even include him. So he's last in every book except for Acts. He's not mentioned. And yet he spent three years with Jesus. He saw Jesus' love. He saw Jesus' compassion. He watched the powerful miracles take place that only God could bring about. He watched that. He was a frontline witness to the lessons of Jesus. He heard the greatest lessons of love ever taught. He, he was right there in the midst of it all. And yet, without being transformed. All the other disciples were transformed to the point where I've talked about it, that they ended strong, faithful, and they're going to be honored in all eternity. And we know honored in heaven in special ways. <clears throat> but Judas, Judas is the one that was never changed, never moved. There's nothing to show that there was something that truly impacted him for eternity. It is possible, therefore, and I want you to hear this, to be in the very presence of God and not be changed. It is possible to hear the lessons of Jesus taught on Sunday mornings. The disciples heard them taught right there face to face, and they were unmoved. They were not impacted, uh, some individuals that heard that. And certainly we see that with Judas uh, Iscari Iscariot. Uh, unteachable, unchangeable. It is not a matter of osmosis. It is a matter of making right decisions. Can I hear an amen to that? We can be in church, and we can be... Uh, touched by church and the things of, that we hear out of the word of God and the time of worship and we can be moved by all of that in the sense of we admire it, we respect it, we love it. But it has to be a change on the inside. It has to be response 
to the claims of Jesus and the things that Jesus taught us. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, the Bible says, and there's a powerful scripture, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. And so that is a very intentional thing to examine yourself. Most people don't do it. It is a very proactive thing to stop and say, I'm going to examine where I'm at and where I'm going and where I want to be. This Saturday, men, I'm going to be talking with you as we get ready uh, to go into what will be the summer season. And a lot of people in the summer go in all directions. They take a break from this. They take a break from that. I want to talk about ways by which at the end of the summer we're going to be chiseled into the image of Jesus that our summers will count for the things that matter in all of, et of eternity, and we're going to set some things in motion. So I'm looking forward to seeing you on Saturday at 10 a.m. here at the church. And, uh, and I believe that what we're going to go through will matter to you. The name Judas is a form of the name Judah. And does anybody know what the name Judah means? It means Jehovah leads now, this begs a question, because here's Judas being named by this very name that means Jehovah leads, and yet we know uh, how his life turned out. And so it begs the question, was Judas meant to rise to a higher calling than what he rose to? And that's a huge question, because it speaks to all of us. Are we meant to rise to something greater than what we're experiencing, greater than what we're living, greater than what perhaps we even know at this moment? Judah, or Judas comes from Judah, Jehovah leads. The Old Testament states that the one, there will be one who will betray the Messiah. And so we read that as a prophecy in the Old Testament. One will betray the Messiah, but it doesn't mention a name. Did it have to be Judas? Could it have been another? We're going to think about that for just a moment. In the Psalms, in the 41st chapter, in the ninth verse, the Bible says, even my close friend, this is the psalmist writing here, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. One of the things that is amazing is that we can read the Old Testament and see so many prophecies that came, through, uh, came true in one person and one person alone, and that's Jesus. All these prophecies had to come true in order for someone to be the true Messiah. You couldn't have most come true, even 90% come true. It had to be 100%. And we see these glimpses that are shared, and this time by the psalmist, as he says that one that is his close friend, one that is trusted, who shared with him in meals and uh, had turned against him. And that's a prophecy speaking to what will happen with the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. Let's look in the Psalms in the 55th chapter, starting with the 12th verse. And we see again, I'm reading out of the Old Testament, so I'm reading a prophecy. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among worshipers. So let's see in Zechariah, in the 11th chapter. And we don't oftentimes go to the book of Zechariah. You're being blessed today. Here it is, Zechariah 11, 12th verse and the 13th verse. I told them, if you think it is best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it uh, to the, the, porter, uh, the potter, the handsome price at which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the potter at the house of the Lord. So we see some reference points that we'll see in greater clarity as we get into the New Testament, as we understand better what was happening in these last days before Jesus is, uh, is going to the cross and then rises from the dead. All of this brings up a larger question, and here's the larger question, and that is predestination or free will. I have watched full denominations split over this issue. I have seen Christians that are friends no longer talk to each other over this issue. 
And people get so dogma dogmatic about it that they're certain that they're right and the other person is wrong in regard to, again, predestination versus free will. And, uh, and when I look at predestination and free will, I can tell you predestination is all through the scriptures. You'll see it like a thread that goes all the way through the scriptures. You say, so pastor, you're for predestination. Well, I can tell you that there are a number of statements in the scriptures that say that we are predestined. And then we see in scripture that free will is all the way through the scriptures. And we see that it's over and over again that our decisions matter, that we're not robots that have been wound up and set forward to just go forward and we act the way we're supposed to act because uh, we're, we're uh, predestined to do it. We do have free will. So it's just like each of our hands coming together. They interlace. If somebody says it's predestination and predestination alone, we don't have free will, uh, I don't agree. And somebody says it's free will. There's no God act in it at all. It's all by our decision and by our will. I don't agree. I believe that all of it comes together. And if you disagree with that, you're wrong. Okay, here we go. <laughs> That's the reality of it. So which is it for Judas? Which is it for Judas? Was he predestined to be the great betrayer? No greater traitor in human history than Judas? Or did he make his own choices? Well, let's look at this a little further. And part of what I want to do as one that is declaring the word of God to you is that I'm stoking the fire of interest in this subject matter so that you will talk about it through the week. Maybe you'll go to lunch today and you'll say, you know, this certain thing stood out to me or this is why I think that uh, pastor is right um, on this with predestination and free will and the fact that that car needs a muffler. Okay, all of this. So in Luke twenty two twenty two, the Bible says, the son of man will go at, as it has been decreed uh, but woe to that man who betrays him. So many of Jesus' teachings seem to be actually targeted toward Judas Iscariot. In the parable of the shrewd manager that we see in Luke 16, it's also known as the parable of the unjust steward. It ends with Luke 16, 13 with these words. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other. Or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now Judas would have been right there, again, front row seat on the teachings of Jesus. I can tell you, uh, Pastor Julie mentioned that we will be going as a church. Uh, those who desire to go, let's go to Israel together. We'll be looking at that for April of next year. And there's an interest meeting right after the service today. And we'll talk more about that. And, uh, and we have been uh, to Israel in the past, uh, some of us, and st stood right where the, um, the Beatitudes were taught by Jesus. And as we stood there, there were certain lessons that we learned that gave us insights into uh, the Beatitudes that we never would have had any other way. The illustrations that Jesus used, what he uh, spoke of, and how it is that on sight you see these various things that speak directly to the lesson. It opened our eyes to the lessons of Jesus. Now, Judas Iscariot is one of the disciples. He's right there present with Jesus as he's saying, you can't have two masters. You can't serve the world and serve God. You can't love money and have money your focus and the American dream. It's all about that. Jesus didn't say the American dream, but the whole concept that I'm going to get this, I'm going to accumulate this, and uh, the one that dies with the most toys and the biggest toys and the best toys wins. Well, that's not scriptural. And so we know that Judas was right there, but Judas was unmoved. Didn't change him. Now the plot thickens. He is known as Judas Iscariot. Iscariot is not his last name. Iscariot signifies the region from which he has come. That's what Iscariot is. And it tells us that Judas was likely the only disciple that was not from Galilee. Now, why does that matter? Because as theologians and scholars look at this, they believe as they discuss this and they, they hash it out, they believe that 
uh, Judas's background, his family, his friends, his associations would likely have been unknown to the other disciples. If you are an FBI agent, and we've had FBI agents in the church, I used to love how we would have communion before COVID where uh, we would stand here and everybody would come up to the pastors who would give the communion elements and then go back to their seats. And we shifted that with all of the COVID stuff so that people could feel more comfortable having communion right where you're seated. But one of the reasons why I used to love having people come up is we could look right in your eyes. We could speak a blessing over you in that way. Maybe we can get back to that soon here. But another reason why I loved it is I, I every now and then would see that somebody was packing. I mean, I'd see that gun as they would be, you know, I'd reach my hand over on their shoulder. They'd reach out their hand on my shoulder and I see a gun. <laughs> and uh, I felt safer because I knew them. If I didn't know them, that could be a different thing. But, uh, and we've had so many wonderful people in the church that have had such fascinating stories and secret service and I didn't even, I mean, I knew there were snipers. I didn't know there were counter snipers, but I know it now. And, and, and all types of people through the years of the church that have come through. And, uh, and I don't even really know why I was talking about uh, that. But if you're in the FBI, I can tell you this. Judas would have been profiled as a loner. He would have been profiled as a loner. Back when the hijackers hijacked the planes on 9-11 and went into buildings and all of that, uh, catastrophe, the tragedy, I remember that's when we first came to the D.C. metro area was 11 days before 9-11. Our kids made friends in their school, just brand new, made brand new friends, and some of the parents of their friends were injured and affected at the Pentagon. Uh, badly injured some. And so uh, it was uh, a time in history that just, I, th I believe, shocked uh, everybody. But there was a study that was done, and it was actually a program that I watched. And it talked about how it was that the 9-11 attackers were trained to go into new communities in the United States. And the idea was if they would go into a new community, the way Americans are they, is that they don't really get to know their neighbors. And so they would allow, be allowed to be alone in their plans and not be observed because Americans don't go across the way to get to know their neighbors. They just are alone. And they counted on that as part of the strategy of what they did on 9-11. But there is no evidence that we see, none whatsoever, that Judas was treated any different or as an outsider by his fellow disciples. Now Judas was the treasure of the group of disciples. And in John 12, 6, we see that Judas helped his, himself to the money bag. So here's Judas. He's not only the one that we know will desire the, the pieces of silver for the betrayal, but it's a lifestyle what we see in Judas is that he's, he's pilfering the money that's coming in, that's supporting Jesus' ministry and what Jesus is doing. Let's look at John 12, starting in the first verse. The Bible says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Mar Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. And then Mary uh, took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it, out, it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And so we read in the scripture there that uh, Jesus is so loved by Mary. And Mary here is pouring out something of great value, that perfume upon Jesus. Did she know she was anoint anointing him for his death? I don't know. But she is doing this right before he will go to the cross. And she's pouring this out. It's changing the atmosphere in the room. 
People smell it. They recognize that she's pouring out something of great value. And Judas disrespects Jesus amidst the love that Mary's showing towards Jesus. He considers this as being of great value, what she is doing, and that it is a year's wages that is squandered. And it is believed by the scholars and theologians that this was a turning point for Judas Iscariot. Because he saw that what he believed to be a year's worth of wages was being, in his mind, squandered, and it clicked something inside of him. He didn't like it. It was money that he couldn't pilfer as he went along. He only saw the money. He didn't see the advancement of the kingdom of God. He didn't see, perhaps, what Mary saw, that it was a moment to anoint Jesus in this way. Matthew 26, we know the Last Supper is spoken of, amongst other things, in that chapter. And Jesus says in Matthew 26, one of you will betray me. And each disciple asked, is it I? Now, that's a very fascinating question. Is it I? And you would hear each one, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? In other words... If Judas was the obvious person to be the betrayer, why would each one be asking, is it I? The other disciples were unsuspecting. I don't believe that they thought that it was Judas. If Judas was the op- obvious traitor, every one of them would have been going, you know who it is, but they were unsuspecting. In John 6, 64, the Bible tells us that Jesus knew that within his disciples' group was unbelief. And he was referring in the scriptures to Judas. The pervasive atmosphere in Israel was what we've talked about many times. And uh, we talked about it at Palm Sunday or Easter, we'll talk about how it is that Jesus would come in on Palm Sunday and people thought as they're, yell, uh, as they're crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, meaning Lord save us, that he was going to be a political Messiah. That was the pervasive atmosphere that Jesus was going to take that moment and break the back of the Roman government and tyranny that, they were, that the people were experiencing And he would change it all because he's a political messiah. But he didn't come to be a political messiah. He came to have the throne of the human heart. And people's expectations were dashed. Now, uh, there is no reason to believe that the other disciples saw Judas as being any different. Or focused on him as a betrayer. In John 6, 15, the Bible says, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. He knows what their expectation is, but he knows what he's come to do, and he's going to be true to his calling, even if he has to escape and get alone. Judas was very likely looking for Jesus again to be political Messiah. So the disciples uh, would then be in a, in a position to be in a position of power. So remember the, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder? And they were arguing over who would be on the right and who would be on the left uh, of Jesus' throne. They're not talking about heaven. They're talking about this concept they have of a political throne and they want to have power, and they want to have influence, and they want to exact change, and this is all that they're desiring to do, and they're arguing about it, and that's where they want to be. And those are the sons of Zebedee, James and John, as the other disciples were indignant. Now, there's a theory, and in this theory that I'm going to say right now, it's just a theory, but it gets us thinking. Here's the theory. Since the Jews were actively looking for Jesus to be a political Messiah and assume the throne and Jesus instead takes a different path than what is expected. The theory that some people propose is that Judas resolves to force Jesus's hand and get him to become the king, a political king. 
So G- Judas begins a crisis between Jesus and Jesus' enemies, believing Jesus will then set up an earthly kingdom and Judas will ask forgiveness and be restored <clears throat> and then be in power. Now, I can tell you such a theory is not backed up by scripture, but I've heard the theory out there and people talk about it. So why did Jesus betray, uh, why did Judas betray Jesus? Was it for money? 30 pieces of silver would have been about uh, a few hundred dollars in the amount of money if it were today's money. So that's not a great deal. Judas could have pilfered through time and gotten a lot more than taking that 30 pieces of silver. Now Judas knew where Jesus came to pray. And if you go to Israel with us, we'll go right to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's still a beautiful garden. And, uh, and you can walk through the trees and, the, and all that they have planted there that has such beauty. But we always focus in on the scriptures and consider what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. So that's where Jesus would go to pray. And in John 18, 3, the Bible tells us that uh, they're about this. Judas comes uh, with Rome, uh, Roman guards or troops. And a Roman cohort at that, uh, at that time would have been about 600 men. So oftentimes when we see this in movies or we see it as a play, we see a few guards standing there, and that's because they don't have a big budget for costumes or whatever. But maybe if we look at this as to what a cohort would have been, it would have been 600. So we're thinking maybe more like hundreds were coming to where Jesus was uh, in the garden. In John 18, uh, 4 through 5, uh, we see that um, Jesus doesn't hide uh, from, uh, from anybody, certainly does not hide from Judas. So let's uh, read that in, in the 18th uh, chapter in the 4th and 5th verses. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, remember he's God, he says, went out and asked them, who is it you want? And remember, I've said this before, I want to say it again. Whenever you hear God asking a question, it's not because he doesn't know. He's God. He all, has all knowledge, all wisdom. When a question is asked by God, it's a drawing out from you. It's a drawing out of something from the heart. It's a drawing out of a response. Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said, and Judas the traitor was standing there with them. And when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Months ago, I said something I want you to hear again. Some of you are hearing it for the first time. The best translation for that is not I am he. The best translation for that and proper translation is I am. I am the great I am. I am God. That's a statement of deity. When Jesus said, I am, they stood back and fell to the ground by the power of Almighty God and who he is. So what an amazing moment. What an amazing scripture that we read there. Judas is present. Jesus does not hide himself. In Matthew 26, 48, the Bible says that Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. Let's go to Matthew 27 now for a moment and As we look at this in the third and fourth chapters, the Bible says, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. Jesus has now been taken away, taken to the cross. He seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, but it's too late now. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. Sin is a horrible taskmaster. We think of sin, it's like, it's like fireworks that go up into the night sky and they look brilliant and beautiful and then they fall to earth like ashes. And sin will hold on to you till it has exacted a price. 
And here he is with great remorse and he wants to give the money back and he wants to be able to have everything the way it used to be. And you wonder, did Jesus' love finally penetrate his heart? Did it finally get to the point where the love that Jesus showed to him changed him? Now theory again, is that due to Judas's plan being in vain and backfiring, we read this scripture, now this is scripture here in the fifth verse, Judas hangs himself. And so Judas will be replaced by Matthias, will take his place and become a disciple. There is a monument found at Saratoga, speaking of the battle during colonial times. And that monument is a very unique monument. It's not like any other monument. If you go into Washington, D.C., if you go to the park where we hand out sandwiches and clothing and other things and love on people there in the park that are vulnerable and who wonder if their families know they're alive, you'll see these statues. The statues oftentimes have the leader maybe one foot forward, looking very strong, looking forward. Sometimes it's a colonial. Sometimes it's a civil war. Sometimes it's a president or somebody else. Sometimes they're on their horse looking as strong as can be. At Saratoga, it's not like that. Not with this one memorial, at least, or monument. You'll see it, and on that monument is a boot. That's all you see. You don't see the face of a person. You see a boot. And it speaks the story of this boot and why this monument looks like this. And it speaks of a brilliant general and it speaks in terms that are so glowing and adoring of what this general did because this general got his foot it was severely injured and the boot that you see represents the severe injury of this general but because this general led the battle that ended up being a turning point in the colonial war in the revolutionary war this general is honored only there's one difference. It never tells his name. Because his name was Benedict Arnold. Who gave information over to the British and betrayed the colonies by what he did. And the colonial infantry and others, he betrayed them all by what he did in giving the information that he gave away. His name will not be known. But he lived and his actions are known. Stand to your feet if you will. The same is true of Judas. His name will be known. In the book of Acts, his name will not even be stated. But we do know what happened in his life. Now, I want to end this with this thought. And that is that when Jesus is there in the Garden of Gethsemane and Judas Iscariot betrays him with a kiss, Jesus calls him friend. I've always been amazed by that. It's always been something that causes me to stop when I'm reading the scriptures and think, Jesus, you called Judas friend. You knew he was coming to betray you. You knew that because of what he was doing at that moment, it would cause you to go to the cross. You knew this and yet you call him friend. There is something about our God that is so merciful, so forgiving. Now I want you to think about your own life. The things that you have been through, the things that you've done, the things that have been done to you, the things that have gotten you a bit hard of heart gotten you to a place where maybe you're somewhat skeptical, you have doubts, it's all right. God loves you and he's going to break through in those. God wants you to know you're unconditionally loved today. There's nothing to show that Jesus calling him friend turned anything inside of Judas. But Jesus, I wonder, was Jesus seeking to redeem Judas even in the last moments? Even at the point of saying, you've betrayed me, you've done it now, I had to be betrayed, it was prophesied. I knew I would be betrayed. Now you've done it. Now will you repent? Now will you know that I love you? Now will you finally know my grace? Will you finally rise up to the true calling? Judas, Judah, the calling that is in your life to be so much more than how you've lived. As every head is bowed and every eye closed, I want you to know that you have a calling on your life. I want you to hear that. You have a calling on your life, and that calling is one that you're meant to live in. You're meant to be immersed in. 
act and to react according to the calling of God on your life and the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how we're meant to go through this generation. Never were we meant to get so busy about things that are temporal and will never matter in all eternity. Instead, we were meant to rise up to the true calling until we're chiseled into the image of Jesus and the things that we're doing are showing forth the power of God in our lives and touching the lives of others. It humbles us to know that God sees us that way. But I want you to live that way. I want you to be saturated at every fiber of your being in regard to the calling that God has on your life. You're meant to, as the other disciples have been recorded by scripture and by church history, to remain faithful all the days of your life and to end strong. As every head is bowed and every eye closed, I want you to have the confidence that when you leave this place that you have victory in every aspect of your life. I don't want you leaving with something so heavy on you that it's kept you up at night. It's a struggle that few know about and you need the breakthrough, but you're just hunkering down and trying to get through the season. No, let's go by scripture and know that he and she whom the son has set free is free indeed. And so that freedom that the Bible speaks of belongs to you. It's yours by inheritance. Jesus came to give you abundant life, not to give you an average life. Jesus came that you might have abundant life. What does abundant life mean? The God kind of life. Life without shame. Life without guilt. Life without having to carry things and burdens that were never meant for you to carry. I pray that the chains will be broken off of you in the name of Jesus. I pray that you will have the victory of God in every aspect of your life, not saying, well, I'm good enough, but walking in the power and the might and the purposes of God. We don't have time to be lethargic. We don't have time to make excuses. The grace of God is here for us now. We can make a decision where we know where we stand with God and we can walk from here knowing our purposes are everywhere we go. We're taking the land for Jesus Christ, for Almighty God.